Well, as you heard in the children's message, um, we're going to focus today on the Old Testament reading. And uh, as you also heard Pastor Adam say, this is typically not something that you may have heard a sermon on before. Uh, when he and I were talking about this, um, I said, you know, this past year at Concordia Seminary, where I serve as a professor, uh, we have chapel every day during the week. So we preach on a lot of different texts that aren't in the normal lectionary. And I was assigned this text, and I told him I really enjoyed this because very seldom do we ever preach on it. It's usually just a Bible story that we teach to children. So today you're going to hear a sermon on the story of David and Goliath. One thing I want you to keep in mind right now, and I'll bring it up again later, and that is what I call the three R's for giant-sized challenges. The three R's for giant-sized challenges. You may, be, you may be familiar with some of the three R's, like the three R's of the, the environment. Do some of you know that? Uh, the kids probably do. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, or the three R's as we're looking towards the school year of education, reading, writing, arithmetic, which I never quite understood because we can't spell right there, but the reading, writing, arithmetic. Well, the three R's for giant size challenges, which I'll unpack later, are remember, rest, and respond. Remember, rest, and respond. It was fun listening to a children's message on David versus Goliath, and Pastor Adam does a very good job of that. Um, I liked his emphasis on God is giving you a task to do uh, in daily life, which you're able to do you know, prayerfully with his help in faith. We know, of course, children don't always obey their parents. No stories here, but... Um, but acting in faith, they are able to do that, as, uh, as we uh, know to be the case. We're able to clean our room. We're able to um, even clean out the litter box, those kinds of things. Well, when I was first learning the story of David and Goliath, I thought David was being called to do something that was miraculous, that he had to have superpowers to do it. You know, it's this little man, little young man, David, versus this giant named Goliath. And uh, in popular thinking, that's the way most people think about David versus Goliath, is this uh, superhero, this greatest of all underdog victories. Well... Think, be open to thinking a little differently about that today. One thing that I recall when I first uh, heard that story is that is great. That's very interesting. I like it. But I can't really follow David's example. It would be like telling me to jump up on the house, you know, as we heard in the children's message today. But as you dig deeper into this text, I think you might find it says something just a little bit different that... Through faith in Christ, you can really apply in your own life in facing giant-sized challenges or what seem to be giant-sized challenges. I have those in my life, and I know that you have them in yours. Not because I know each of your stories, but I know what it's like to be a sinner in this fallen world and facing the challenges that we have. Well, I said we're going to take a closer look at this story, so that's what we'll do. And you're able, if you want to, you can follow along in the bulletin, but I'm going to summarize it as, as we heard. It's a pretty lengthy, lengthy text. So what was going on is that you had the Israelites, the people of Israel, and their, one of their arch enemies, the Philistines, that were engaged in a battle. And you had the Israelites on one side and the Philistines on another and this valley in between. And the story goes like this. Um, Goliath, this giant-sized man, this great warrior of the Philistines, 
comes and stands in the middle of this valley and he shouts up to the Israelites on the other side, those who came to do battle. And he gives them threats that, you know, we're going to defeat you, but he gives them an option. He says, you could send somebody down here to fight me. And if that person wins, essentially you win and we become your servants. But if I defeat him, then you all become our servants. Well, you heard the response of the Israelite warriors and their king Saul. And that was, we want nothing to do with this guy. They were afraid and they trembled in fear. Well, David's brothers, David was from a pretty large family. David's brothers, several of them were there. They were afraid. David was not. And that's because David was the youngest in his family. And somebody had to take care of the sheep, even during times of war. So David was back doing the work of being a shepherd. But his dad told him, David, we need to supply your brothers on the front line with food, like food from our gardens, like your gardens here. We need to provide them with bread. We need to provide them with those things that they need. And so take these to your brothers, and David does. Now, we don't hear about that, and that was not in what we read today, but that's going on there. And so that's how David gets to the battle lines, and he is bringing them food. While he's there, Goliath is up, which he does every morning, up there doing his thing, giving threats to the people of Israel, issuing challenges uh, to them that if they send somebody down to fight him, then, um, then we'll see how it turns out, and nobody wants to do it. David overhears this. And David is not afraid. That's interesting, isn't it? David is not afraid. So David, hearing this, he thinks he can take this giant. He thinks this is a task he can handle. He desires to respond. And he starts talking about this. Again, some things that aren't in the text today. He, he talks to others and he asks about, well, isn't anybody going to stand up to this giant? Is anyone going to stand up to this person who is threatening God and his people? And they're all saying, well, no. And David said, well, I can do that. And word gets to King Saul. And Saul calls David and says, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think you can handle that. Uh, and Saul says to da and David says to Saul, well, yeah, I can, actually, because here's what I do as a shepherd. I take care of the sheep, and sometimes a lion comes and tries to attack the sheep. And I defeat the lion using the equipment that I have. And his equipment, of course, we know is a sling. One of the children mentioned that today. And then when a bear comes, I defend the sheep from the bear. This Philistine is no different than this lion and this bear. I can handle him. And you know what? He convinces Saul. And Saul says, okay, well, I can't just send you out there like that. Let me give you my armor and... He gives David his armor to try on. And, and it's interesting how David responds. He says, hmm, I'll try it on. And he does. He says, no, this isn't going to work. I haven't tested this. In other words, this isn't what I'm used to using. I don't wear armor. He doesn't say this, but it's kind of what the text is implying. I don't wear armor when I defeat these lions and bears. No. Um, i got to stick with what I'm used to. I'll use my equipment. So he takes his sling, and he goes and picks out some stones that, that are going to work for him. And uh, he puts them in his pouch. And uh, David heads out to face Goliath. Goliath, of course, is up to uh, his usual tactics of threats and curses. But he amps it up a little bit because he's feeling insulted. Uh, they sent this, this very young man out there to face him, someone who isn't carrying, wearing armor and isn't, doesn't have a spear and a javelin. 
a shield. And uh, David stands up to him. He says, you should not talk about the God of the universe, the living God that way. You should not be threatening his people. I have come here to defeat you. David is not afraid. And you know what? It's a very short part of our text, but it's the whole battle. In your reading, it's like one little paragraph. David comes up. Now, he doesn't get super close uh, because he doesn't want to. He doesn't need to. He simply puts a, a stone in his sling, and he throws it and hits Goliath square in the forehead rather hard. The stone sank into his forehead. That sounds painful. And it knocked him cold. And he falls down out. David comes up beheads him, and the people of Israel, emboldened by David, uh, overtake the Philistines, win the battle. That's the story. There's two key factors that, uh, that David has going on here that produces the victory. And they both involve the Lord's promises to provide. The first was God promised to his people Israel that he would never leave them nor forsake them. So no matter what they face, even if they are impossible tasks, God's going to provide in this life, and if not now the way we want him to, in the life to come. And David, when he was just a young man, was chosen to be the successor of King Saul that was not announced publicly or anything at this point, but it had already happened before this, this encounter. And perhaps you remember that story when, when the prophet Samuel goes to the house of Jesse and they're trying to determine who is going to be anointed king because God told Samuel that it would be from the sons of Jesse. And Jesse parades all these sons of his out there except for David who's out there again, tending sheep. He's the youngest. And, and the Lord reveals to Samuel, nope, I'm not choosing any of these. He says, well, do you have another son? Yes. And uh, they bring David in. And it says, David was chosen not because of his outward appearance, his age, his, his, his physique, those kind of things, but because of his heart. And his heart trusted the promises of God, that God was with him and for him. And in the Bible, where we read about David and his life, the thing that always comes up that shows us why David was chosen to be king was because he trusted in God's promises. Now, you may know that many of the Psalms were written by King David, and many of them reflect his trust in God's promise that he would always be with him. I'll read you just an excerpt, a brief excerpt of one of them from Psalm 57. David wrote, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man, whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. My heart is steadfast, O Lord. David trusted in God in the face of whatever was before him. And that brings me to the second of two key factors in the story of David and Goliath. And this is where I think sometimes we miss the mark. So think about this for a minute. Because David trusted in God, and he wasn't overcome with anxiety and fear, as were Saul and the other warriors of Israel, he was able to assess the situation and really determine what it would take. Now, it wasn't fear and intimidation that were running the show. It was just a good, reasoned response. And where he came out of that assessment was this. Hey, 
a very competent shepherd who was a slinger. <laughs> that means he knew how to use a sling who could defeat lions and tigers, lions and bears, could defeat this Goliath, this giant. Now, you may not be familiar with a couple of Bible passages about slingers, but let me rent, read a couple of them to you. In Judges 2016, we see this. Among Benjamite warriors, these are people who go out to battle, were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a rabbit and not miss. And rabbits are fast and they're small. These guys were deadly accurate. In 1 Chronicles 12, it says, Among the mighty men who helped David in war were fighters who sling stones with either the right or the left hand. You see, slingers in battle were like the um, artillery. And artillery versus the ground troops who uh, are fighting hand-to-hand -hand on the front lines, well, maybe not much of a battle there. Or it might even be thought of as the air war, the people flying the planes versus those on the ground. All David needed was an opening in Goliath's armor large enough for a, a stone to hit him in the head. Now, let me tell you about these stones. We, we know from ancient Near Eastern research. They were about the size of a baseball, and they weighed three times the size of a baseball, typically. And good slingers would, would throw them with their slings at over 100 miles an hour. That's what hit Goliath in the head. And all Goliath had were this, was this very large spear that he would have to throw a great distance to hit David, who could simply step aside from that. That equipment that he had was made for somebody to come right up at him and basically be in close combat. David never needed to do that. All he needed was an opening the size of a stone to hit him in the head, which he obviously had. There was another factor that made this a very reasonable fight for David, and that is Goliath's arrogance. Goliath thought nobody could defeat him. He was blinded by his own pride to David's ability to do what God had equipped him to do. So the two factors, David trusted in God's promises and so wasn't overcome by fear and anxiety. And secondly, he had skills and abilities that God could use for him to execute what God called him to do. David versus Goliath, therefore, can be a lesson for us. We don't have to be superheroes. We don't have to jump onto houses. We don't have to uh, defeat somebody hand-to-hand -hand who is much stronger and bigger than we are. So this is the three R's of facing giant-sized challenges. Remember God's promises. Rest in in hope, or you could even say relax in hope, and then respond with resources. Remember God's promises, rest in hope, respond with resources. Let me unpack that just for a moment. Remember God's promises. God has made a promise to you in Jesus Christ, our Savior. He made that promise personally to you in, ba in your baptism into Christ's death and resurrection because that promise is all about Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus came into the world and died for you to pay for all of your sins. Everything that were, was there to separate you and me from God, Jesus has taken away. And when he rose from the dead, he showed that God is for us and nothing, not even death, can be against us. That's the promise that we need to always remember. In fact, Luther in the catechism says, when you get up in the morning, make the sign of the cross and say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to remember that promise that God has made to you so that that day you'll be able to face the challenges that lie in front of you. Another thing to remember when you come to the Lord's table today 
is that you're being given that promise. The promise that Christ's body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins is real food for real life for now and eternity. And that's what allows you to rest in hope. So remembering his promises, you can rest in hope or relax in hope. Maybe that's even better. Knowing that God is relaxed with you, you can be relaxed with God. And in whatever you face, knowing that God Almighty is for you, nothing can be against you. That was the kind of confidence that David had. That's why David was chosen as king, because his heart trusted in God's promises and he rested in hope. That's what gives us the ability to deal with those struggles that at times might seem like giant-sized challenges. The devil will amp those up. He'll magnify those in our eyes until we remember God's promise to us and can rest in our hope and say, get behind me, Satan, I'm baptized. Helps us stay calm. And it helps us do what David did. He was able to assess the situation accurately. Now, David could have assessed the situation differently if it had been another, another warrior. Let's say he was called on to face five slingers from the Philistines. I don't think David would have responded the way that he did because he would have assessed it differently. Different tactics would be needed. And not all challenges that we face are overcomable by us in this life but we can still rest in hope in Christ because we know that Christ has given us the promise that the ultimate victory is ours in whatever situation we face. But oftentimes we are. I would say more often than we think. And that's where we are able to respond with our resources. The things that God gives us to use, just as we heard in the children's message today. Encouraging children in faith to honor their father and their mother. Whether you're facing challenges that seem giant size regarding relationships, maybe it's finances, maybe health, and maybe it's just watching the news in this hopeless and hostile world. When you remember God's promises, rest in his hope, and then simply figure out how assessing the situation to respond to the resources that God has given you. Many good things happen. Many good things happen as God calls us to serve. No superpowers needed, well, except one, faith, the gift of trusting in those promises that comes from the Holy Spirit, the gift of faith in those promises that give you the ability to respond because they give, it gives you that peace that surpasses all understanding, that keeps and guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to do the work he calls you to do and to life everlasting. Amen.